for, for those of you who are new to the bookmarks uh, talk uh, and haven't been here before, these are uh, open conversations where we speak uh, with people working on uh, some interesting things involving open access books. This uh, one hour session will be split in uh, two parts. A first part where we'll be interviewing uh, our guests with some prepared questions. And a second part where we open up the floor and everyone is invited to write or uh, ask their questions in person. Uh, please feel free, however, to add your questions to the chat already, and um, we'll pick up on them during the, the second part of the session then. I would like to mention that the uh, session will be recorded and made available on our uh, YouTube channel afterwards. If you would not like to be in the uh, recording, feel free to uh, turn your camera off. Uh, my name is uh, Tom Moster. I am the community manager at the Directory of Open Access Books and OAPEN. And uh, together with my colleagues, uh, Agatha Morka and Lucy Barnes, also present here today, I'm one of the coordinators for the Open Access Books uh, Network. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, and welcome our guests for today, Dr. Reggie uh, Raju, Director of Research and Learning Services, and uh, Jill Klaassen, the Scholarly Communications uh, and Research, both from the University of Cape Town Libraries. Um, Reggie and Jill have been working on a continental platform for open research in Africa. The platform has been set up as a library as a publisher service. It aims to empower the library to actively contribute to the denorthernization of the publishing landscape in order to make scholarship more inclusive and to empower libraries to openly share African scholarship within Africa with the rest of the world. Um, Without further ado, I think we can begin with the, um, the question. So I think the first question that we, that we have here is um, if you could tell us a little bit more about the, the platform uh, to hear from you, how it came about, uh, who funds it, who runs it, and how researchers in Africa can make sure that their research is deposited there. So I'm gonna answer I think two of the two of those questions, Tom. Um, so to tell a, a bit about the platform, it's an open source publishing platform uh, that resides on UCT, so the University of Cape Town server, um, using PKP products, uh, open journal systems, and open monograph press. And so the model we use is a, a tenant model where each tenant it presents an institution um, and the institution will have their own look and feel to it. Um, and the, the institution has their own address um, and it's important for that to take place so that institutions have their own pride. Um, that was critical for us. And it's important that when institutions um, uh, scholarship is, uh, is displayed, it has their own URL. So that's the the tenant model that we use. And then you ask the question, um, who funds it? Uh, so uh, yeah, like I said, it's on UCT server. So the cost is, is minimal. Uh, UCT's uh, network infrastructure is, is stable and um, you know, it has advanced storage and backup, et cetera. Uh, each uh, institution who, um, who's part of the platform, they um, make application for their own ISPN and own um, ISSN. Um, they purchase their own DOIs. Um, yeah, so they're responsible for that. And then I think Reggie, uh, I don't know if you want to answer the third question. Maybe Tom, if you can repeat it. No, it's about uh, how did we get there? Um, yeah, no, I, I think, I think uh, thanks Tom. Um, UCT, although it was a, one of the leading research universities on the African continent, um, they were basically latecomers to the open access movement um, uh, in South Africa. And I think the benefit of us being latecomers is that we jumped all of the hurdles that the other institutions jumped. And I think we benefited from the thieving problems that other institutions benefited from. Um, so, so we had a relatively smooth road that have been carved by the other institutions 
um, in South Africa. Um, so when we got into the open access process, um, in around about 2015, we decided to investigate other options in terms of expanding um, our open access services. And that's where we start to talk about um, uh, uh, publishing monographs. And I think publishing monographs was deliberate on our part because other universities in South Africa had already started uh, with journals. Um, and I think we felt that maybe it's an area that hasn't been investigated before. Let's, let's try with that. Um, by the end of that first publication, we felt that over that period of time, uh, we acquired sufficient enough skill uh, with publishing uh, this, this book. But we must also acknowledge that throughout that journey, PKP was always there holding our hands. Um, so at the end of that journey, we were now comfortable uh, with a small group of colleagues who we felt uh, were skilled enough and had the confidence to look at um, uh, uh, investigating the publication of more books, but more importantly, looking at the capabilities of um, the PKP products and to take those capabilities and make it work for us in South Africa and Africa. So now that we sort of had this, this sense of, of confidence, um, we decided let's pay it forward. Um, and as a leading research universe on the African continent with I research output, let's share this. But there are other factors that influence it and a lot of it had to deal with individuals. Um, a number of us come from uh, resistant backgrounds, having dealt with the apartheid regime. We knew, or we had first ex and experience of being marginalized. We had firsthand experience of being unfairly treated. Um, and, and all of these issues gave us a sense that we needed to give back. And this sense of unfairness, this sense of being marginalized, basically led us to the feeling that we now needed to do something different. And we went to um, the, the principles, the underpinning principles of social justice. So our open access movement was underpinned by the whole principle of social justice. And part of the social justice is to show how do we then, if we are talking about social justice, then how do we share? How do we ensure that um, our learnings can be shared with the rest of the continent? Um, and, and, and I think there, there were other positives that were at, at University of Cape Town. Um, firstly, the university had as a strategic goal, what they call social responsiveness. How does the university and all of its entities support society? So this fitted well with our, at that point in time, how do we share? And to be quite honest, at that point in time, it was more um, sharing locally and, and seeing how we can uh, compare notes for one of a better concept. Um, but that commitment was also translated to the leadership within the library um, where they were, we were allowed to experiment. At this point in time, what you must understand, it is wasting library time because we had no idea this is going to be a success. We, nobody else has gone down this road, but we were given the time to experiment and to play with this. Um, and, and I think all of these issues um, compounded to give us a nice position. But at the same time, we had a very supportive 
central IT department. And that central IT department was the epicenter of our model um, because they in fact developed this tenant model that Jill is talking about. How do we bring in other universities onto this, but ensure that these universities had the sense of pride? What you must understand in Africa as much as uh, there's quite of reliance on, on, on um, funding from the global north, we do have a sense of pride. And I think that is what we wanted to capture in this whole process. Um, and, and then we had a couple of willing partners. In the, at the beginning of this process, um, another university in another province uh, was, was willing to partner with us. And what you must also understand is that, and I presume it's across the world, that politics govern higher education. There is some level of competitiveness. And the fact that the Durban University of Technology was going to build its uh, uh, publishing uh, um, agenda on a UCT platform was, was a challenge. So they had to fight that, that political intervention from their leaders. But at the end of the day, they came on board, they published their first journal. So we had success in getting a university from South Africa, from another province to publish on the platform. We then invited the University of Namibia. So how do we get a, a, a university from another country to come on board. And uh, they came on board, we did the training, and now they are publishing five journals on the platform. So that's how it started. And we hope in, in, in the not too distant future, we will have a few more that comes on, come on board. Thanks. Very interesting. And, and actually uh, an observation that what you mentioned about crossing the, the hurdles and making jumps due to um, what others have already done, mm. that, that has helped you, and that in return that you um, from there continue, but also want to help others. It's, it's interesting uh, how you, it kind of comes full circle. Um, then I wanted to touch upon something um, a bit related with the, the north, to the North and the South, which is that um, th there's often uh, widespread uh, praise and enthusiasm for making uh, scholarly literature available to readers at no cost as open access, but potentially uh, harmful externalities and key inequities uh, persist. So wh which of the um, effects deriving from the strong push in the, in the global north towards uh, open access concern you uh, the most for, uh, for, your, for your region and the continent? Uh, uh, Tom, I, I think there are a couple of issues that 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 concern concern me, and I think concerns my colleagues. Um, the first is um, the whole issue of of the control of the publishing landscape, and and I think in the main, the publishing landscape is managed by the Global North. Mm -hmm. The editorial boards of the journals are dominated by Global North researchers. The editors in chief are dominated by Global North um, researchers. The whole review process, the peer reviewers are dominated by the Global North. So this, in, this whole landscape is dominated by the Global North and, and there is a sense of, as far as, as far as we are concerned, in my opinion, a sense of an unconscious bias. So if you have content that is coming from the global south and as a reviewer, and there are examples that I can illustrate to, to show this, that because they do not understand the African context, when they appear reviewing the journal, immediately, 
it's coming from a biased perspective because they cannot see where the, the, research, the African research is coming from. And, 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 and I'll give you a typical example. Uh, one of Africa's leading horticulturalists um, submitted her, her papers to international journals and she was declined all of the time. She was declined not because the methodology was poor. She was declined because the reviewers felt that um, her reporting on uh, uh, her findings were not relevant to the global north. <clears throat> but what had happened subsequently was that she found an open access journal in Africa. She published her content on that journal and it wasn't too long before African governments were now saying to her, we want to use your findings to develop feeding schemes for the schools in the different countries. But the Global North had taken that and said, oh, we're now looking at good eating habits. So they've now taken the same research that she was wanting to share and not publishing it because they didn't see the value. But now that it has been published and people are now using it, they now say, okay, here's value for us. And, and, and then now it's, it's being adopted more widely, but again, used differently. It is, it is an issue of economics. You, those that can pay are the ones that determine your product. That, that's, that's a simple thing. It's understandable, but not necessarily acceptable. Um, that the landscape is shaped in this particular way. Another bugbear for me is the whole issue of transformative agreements. Everybody's saying, yay, transformative agreements are here. That's the, 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 what we call the silver bullet to this. But the question is, how has that changed Africa? How does that change the publishing landscape in, 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 in Africa? How does that open the doors for the transformation of that? And that is why we've come up with the concept of transformational agreements. The critical concept is transformational. How do we transform the landscape? How do we ensure that African content relevant to Africans are access, uh, accessible by Africans as well as the international audience? So we, we, we are basically pushing for transformational agreements to come back to transformative agreements. The crux of a transformative agreement is the conversion of your subscription budget into an APC budget. I may have got that wrong, but that's my understanding. But when you have not bought a book or a journal for the last 10 years, what are you gonna transform? There is no budget. So transformative agreements means basically zero to those institutions who don't have anything to flip. So, so, so those, those, those are some of the challenges that we feel that, that need to be addressed. But the other one that, that I want to address is this, this whole thing about predatory publishing and the Beals list. And what I'm asking for is that, do not look at geography and do not look at, 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 at superficial issues like the Queen's English. Sorry, I'm, you are from the UK, so I need to say the Queen's English, but we're looking at good science. It doesn't have to be in the best English. So predatory publishing should not be uh, built around geography. Come from Africa, give it a chance. Let's try to understand what does the science say? How good is this research? Not is the language the best possible? 
So, so those are those are some of our concerns, and we hope that this platform will be a vehicle to address some of those concerns. Yeah, I, I think that um, the concerns you you've mentioned they are not really resolved in, in some of the current approaches, um, and and hopefully with the platform you will have a a better chance at doing so. So, I. I know that there will be more concerns and probably we can sit here a long time talking about uh, all of them, but uh, given these tensions and inequalities and the examples you mentioned, um, does it really make, make sense to speak of one open access movement or a open access movement as though it is a unified thing? Um, and do you see alternative pathway, pathways for how the open access movement, if that exists, can be organized that will be more inclusive uh, and hold greater benefits for the African continent as well as other regions uh, outside of the, the global north. Yeah, uh, Tom, sorry, it's me again. Okay, uh, until Jill um, uh, chips in, I, I will speak. So, um, as, as, as much as I'm an advocate for the open access movement, I'm also a critic. Uh, critic or, I also crit critique the, the movement. But I think the movement itself, if one has to unpack it, the fundamental principles of that is exceptionally well stated, well founded. And, and what has happened is that the global north has taken that and they've made it their own. So for them, for the global north, the, the, the transformative agreements work for them um, and they can share. That's the principle on which open access movement is, is built, that you take what you've got and you try and share that. You try and share your research, you try to grow research. But in that movement, they've left behind a whole cohort of, of people. And, and, and I am suggesting that maybe, and this is what we are advocating in, 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 um, at UCT uh, as part of this, this platform, is that how do we in Africa make the open access movement our own? How do we make it reflective of our needs, define it so that it is relevant to our uh, circumstances, define it to make it relevant to nurture, grow, and support Africa's research agenda. So I don't think um, one needs to be overcritical of the fact that it is not unified. Well, I would love for it to be unified, but at the same time, I'm also a realist that people have different needs. Um, in, in, in the global South, um, the needs in Africa will be different from the needs in South America the, and, 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 and other countries in India. But I think somewhere along the line, uh, part of us and the Global South need to come up with a strategy that will allow us to redefine open access that would talk to our needs, talk to the needs of the Global South. And within that, you're going to have packages that are relevant to the different areas. So I think the fundamental principle, the philanthropic principles that underpin open access is there. And we just need to harvest that and, and, and make it our own. Yeah, I think that's a, a very sensible alternative that you uh, propose. I hope many will, will join you um, in that view. So when we look at the um, at the platform and at other initiatives uh, within the continent, um, how does this specific platform uh, relate to other research platforms, uh, such as the um, uh, African Ac Academy of Sciences F1000 platform, the AASOpenResearch.org? So in the main, uh, in terms of functionality, 
both are, are publishing platforms. So uh, there are functionality that are in submission, same peer review, as well as the editorial uh, workflow process. So it would be the same, but the fundamental difference would be around cost. Um, the, the African Academy of Sciences charges an APC, whether, you know, whether the funders pay for it, they, they are charging to publish. And that is where the, the, that's where the two platforms uh, go in different directions. Um, we practice Diamond Open Access. So Diamond Open Access through library as publisher, where there is no cost to the public, to, to the author. And that's critical for us because in, in Africa, cost is a barrier. So by putting a cost to publishing research, we are putting a barrier to African scholarship not advancing. We are putting a barrier to, um, to growth uh, of, of African um, content. And it's, that's one critical factor that will, that will always remain, um, that the, the continental platform will have no cost to it or um, very minimal cost that may cover you know, uh, language editing, for, for example. But it's important that there's no profit um, that is attached to it. Um, and then in terms of identity, um, it's going back to the, to the tenant model. Uh, each institution has their own identity on the platform uh, and uh, the output can be viewed from the institution's URL, whether you are um, downloading it and looking at a scholarship in a PDF format or otherwise looking at, looking at it online uh, using HTML or, or EPUB. Most important is that pride um, and showcasing of individual African uh, institutions that can showcase their, um, their scholarship. Tom, I just want to also add um, in, in terms of that, um, we've, we've looked at, uh, at that, that platform and the APC cost there is around about uh, if you had to convert that into South African rands, it's around about 20,000 rands. I am a rated researcher in terms of uh, the South Africa's rating system, and I get uh, research funding from national government. My research funding is 10,000 rands per year. Over a five-year period, it's 50,000 rands. One APC costs 20,000. So I have to wait two years before I can publish one article. Um, so, yeah, so, so that, that is a significant issue. Um, yeah. And, and it puts it in perspective because of course, I think many here are familiar with APCs and some of the numbers, but they of course have completely different meaning in, in different parts of the the world and different values. Um, and if you look at it, I mean, South Africa and the National Research Foundation in, in South Africa is one of the more affluent. And if they can't afford to pay my APCs, then we, we're dead in the water. Mm -hmm. And by, by practicing diamond open access uh, through library publishing, um, we are saying that um, we want publishing of scholarship to come back to the academy so that the academy can drive the publishing landscape rather than leaving it to the traditional publisher. Yes, so, th so there are a few clear differences between uh, di different platforms um, and also, of course, different interests and approaches. Um, because apart from, from uh, the fact that there are obviously actual costs, there's a different way to how you um, resolve that and, and who is confronted with uh, the issue of cost. Um, so, um, so I think part of the next question is already an answered. It talks about the, the diamond model. So charging no fees to offers uh, and also not to readers. Um, and my first part of the question would be why you, you pick this model, but I think that's, that's quite clear actually. Um, but the second part is how does the, the platform envision uh, its uh, sustainability and, and cost recovery in the, in the longer term? I, I, I think 
to be quite honest about this thing, I think cost recovery has never been part of our thinking. Um, and, and maybe it is sticking our heads into the sand, but be that as it may, it was never part of our thinking. But the issue of sustainability was something that we thought long and hard about. And as, as Jill indicated, um, we want libraries to take ownership of the publishing process on the African continent. And I don't think, as a librarian, I don't think that is an unfair ask. And I'll tell you why. Our role as librarians is to collect, organize, and disseminate information. That has always been our role. But what we're now doing is doing the same thing, but doing it differently. Um, and I gave the example of the fact that there are libraries on the African continent that haven't been buying books and journals for a long time. So what are the librarians going to do in this period where access to information, where their core responsibility is reference work, when there is no material to link the, the user to the reference query. So by reinventing ourselves as librarians, playing these new roles, librarians taking ownership of, uh, of collecting, organizing and disseminating the research output uh, of your institution in one instance, and maybe of the continent. I think that reinvention, that reimagination of our roles is what we talked about in terms of sustainability. As long as a university is in existence, we hope that a library will be in existence, an academic library, and for me, Academic libraries need to fulfill their core responsibilities, as, as I indicated, in terms of collecting, organizing, and disseminating information. We can't do it when there is no information. So let us be proactive. Let us do uh, um, this, this, this organization and the training that will support this particular process. Interesting. So it's, it's more a process of re reinvention. Yes. Um, so I, um, then I will go back to actually something um, that was mentioned in the, the introductory uh, blog post from, from last week. And there it was mentioned that uh, at this point in time, there is no uh, structured uh, advocacy plan as it will be developed when the platform is migrated from the University of Cape Town to a non-aligned or, or neutral host. Um, could you tell a bit more about the, the vision for the future of the, the platform and how you will see it, uh, or how you hope to see it develop? Here, I, I think um, how I would like to see it developed is that every university on the African continent adopts their platform. But I think I also need to be, be um, um, a realist. Um, uh, we, we, we would like to see the platform being used um, and being used by as many universities on the African continent. Um, I, I think it, it, that, that, that vision um, that we talked about or that you, we talk about is, 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 is fairly narrow and fairly focused so that um, I, 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 I don't think that we ever imagined that this platform would take off the way it has. Um, the fact that it has taken off, the fact that there is so much of interest has caught us 
unaware. You ask the question of a vision, and now I'm going to have to think back and say, did we have a vision when we started? We just wanted to get this thing done. We just wanted to share this thing. Now that you ask me, what is your vision? Now I'm saying, okay, uh, what would I like to see? Have I ever, ever imagined this to happen? But now that you ask the question, it'll be phenomenal if the, uh, the Association of African Universities could say, here is a product, we adopt this product. And if that happens, then almost immediately there's a boost, there's a boost in our credibility. When I say our credibility, I talk about the platform itself. Um, and, and there are many other entities that are so willing to work with us um, to, to make sure that this is a success. And as, we, as you mentioned, until it moves to a neutral venue, we are very, very cognizant of the fact that Af South Africa is viewed as the big brother. And very often, people will not adopt it because it's come from South Africa. Not because it's not gonna work for them. It's, it's, it's that kind of thing. So if it moves to a neutral venue and we are talking to um, the Western, I, don't, I, don't, I've, I've, I can't get the full title of the acronym, but WACREN and, and to see if they can't work with us. In fact, we are in engagement with them to have it in this neutral venue um, or to be hosted neutrally. And when that happens, I think there's gonna be a lot more interest. There will be a lot more lobbying um, champions on the African continent um, to adopt this. So I think I will be thrilled as, as, as um, if, if at least 50% of the countries in Africa um, adopt uh, the platform uh, and start to publish on that platform. So some other aspirations, Regina, I was speaking about this. <laughs> um, and, you know, in terms of indigenous languages, um, not just publish in, in English, there are um, popular African indigenous languages that we'd like um, scholarship to be to be published in. So like Shona, uh, Swahili, um, Arabic and, and French, for, for example. So not use Google, uh, Google Translate um, as the plugin, but where, uh, where the actual African scholarship can be, um, can be available um, in, in, its, in, its, in its language. Uh, and that's big. Um, I think it's important that we, um, through these aspirations that have been spoken about, we, 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 we try to advance the scholarship so that Africa's percentage of what is available um, can increase from, you know, depending on where you look between one to 3% of African scholarship is accessible uh, through the platform um, and avenues like it to increase and advance um, what comes from this continent. Just, just to say that, um, just to add on to what Jill has said, we plan to launch our first indigenous language, <coughs> excuse me, our first indigenous language book on the 15th of April, it's in Sesotho. Um, and I think we, we are proud, it's not um, uh, it's gonna be a major book, but if we are talking about Africanizing the publishing landscape, then we need to put our money where our mouth is. And hopefully this will be one of many uh, um, books that we'll be publishing in the indigenous language. Yeah, it, it will certainly be a milestone. Um, and um, who knows, it, it just like the idea just beginning and then uh, who knows what may happen if it, if it takes off. Uh, as other things. So I'll, I'll just ask one last question. Um, and then I see because I see there are some questions in the in the chat. Um, and I see Agatha is not nodding. Um, and 
um, the platform is open to um, to all African higher education institutions uh, wishing to use it as a publishing outlet. Um, how can these institutions uh, reach you? So they can contact me. Um, and what usually happens when we, we have requests is um, Reg and I have initial conversations um, around the roles of library, library as publisher, and then um, just editorial workflow, um, capacity building, training sessions, um, which usually take place uh, with the scholarly communication staff and the um, staff are uh, part of our room today. Uh, so they provide uh, support in that way so that um, the institutions are not alone, the library is not alone. Um, and then importantly uh, for us is that uh, academics or researchers, editors in chief, um, when it comes to establishing a journal, they, they are aware of uh, what it needs, you know, what it, what it should con, um, compose of or what it should be uh, what everything should be packaged together mm -hmm. so that that whole the whole bias um, that Reggie spoke about earlier uh, when it comes to African scholarship can then be negated uh, so that so that we uh, we can have quality African scholarship available. Hmm. So there's actually a, a lot of support there uh, as well um, from, from your side. So, okay, I'll just uh, switch to the chat um, and, and take some of the questions from there. Um, I'm just going to start to get one of the, the questions here. Um, let's see. Uh, I see there is a, a question here. Um, do you work at all with uh, San Lick, so S-A-N-L-I-C? for helping fund your publishing program, perhaps through gathering funding from member libraries to support the, the diamond model? Um, I, I think Sandlick is, is a consortia um, and that consortia um, looks at um, negotiating prices. So I, I've, um, I've just completed a document for Sandlick uh, where we, talking about converting transformative agreements into transformational agreements. So, so Sandlick itself um, doesn't have the mandate to support this particular process. So hopefully um, uh, as this gains momentum, the different libraries are able then to come on board on their own um, with, without external funding, but somewhere along the line, we would have to seek funding and, and that funding is not to manage the technical processes. That funding is more to look at ways in which we can generate content. And, and, and my experience from the University of Cape Town is that academics um, do not have the time to teach, research, and publish a textbook. And I'm using textbook because that is the area that we're driving hard in. So if we can get funding to support them to write a textbook so that they can get relief and employ uh, a, uh, um, a postgraduate student to do teaching, so that will allow us then the capacity to generate content. Now I must say the, the one book that we have published, um, which is a constitutional law uh, textbook. Constitutional law is one of the most failed subject in a law degree across the country. Um, a lot of our students are second, third, fourth, fifth speaking, English speaking. So language is a challenge. So what we've done with this textbook is that we've got students to write the textbook and write it at the level that talks to fellow students. And at the end of each chapter to have a mini workbook. 
and and that workbook then serves as, as a kind of uh, preparation for examination for understanding and such now during this COVID period at in the month of november there were 3,700, there were more than 3,700 downloads of this book across South Africa. And for us, that is phenomenal. 3,700 students who never had access before now have access to a textbook. So let me just, I'm trying to work my way through the, the chat. Um, there's one question here coming back to the, the languages and, and um, about the English language and other languages. Um, and the question is, uh, do you think English will still be the, the dominant language of research published uh, on this platform? Or will there be a greater diversity of, of languages? You, you mentioned there will be other languages too. Um, but how, how would you think that that balance might look in, in let's say in a, a positive uh, optimistic scenario? Jill, you want to go, Jill? Uh, believe it or not, I was typing. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, do you want to repeat that? Sorry, Mentom. Go for yeah, it again. No, no worries. <laughs> You're beating me to it, Jill, to the question. So <laughs> it, it was uh, coming back to the English language. About the languages. Yes. So, so you, you mentioned before that um, the platform will also be publishing uh, in other languages than English. Uh, also African languages and a milestone I think the first book you mentioned coming in uh, in April um, mm. but uh, how do you what do you think uh, it will look like on the platform in the future will English be the the dominant language still or will there be uh, more uh, diverse room for, for other languages too mm. so so it depends if we uh, if there would be that uh, you know the technical functionality to, to provide tran translation uh, to African indigenous languages. Um, institutions do have um, indigenous languages as a department. So we have Susutu as a department, academic department at the University of Cape Town. And it you know, just so happened that that academic uh, wanted to publish uh, with us. So uh, we we haven't provided a translation to the to the entire um, you know to the to the publication. We just provided the Susutu uh, monograph. So to answer your question, it it, it it really depends on on the institutions how how much of the indigenous um, you know the the scholarship will be published in. Um, the, the indigenous languages and then you know hopefully as um, as we go along the the ability to to translate um, especially in Swahili for for example would would come about I know that uh, PKP has been uh, developing code um, around um, uh, Arabic so yeah I'm sure I think, Tom, um, we would love to see more uh, indigenous language material, but I think um, the language of research, unfortunately, at this point in time is English. Um, and and uh, we would love to see greater di diversification, but I think um, we need to go with what is dominant uh, rather than be prescriptive. But as much as we talk about what's being dominant, I think the options that Jill talked about a translate, we know a translate is going to be perfect, but it is more than what one has at this point in time. Um, and, and if you can get a translated um, understanding, and if that understanding is basically, this is a, a text that I want, you can then have it formally translated um, and, and, and have it used. So I, I don't think we have, well, I don't have a direct answer for you, but to say that we aspire to be as diversified as we possibly can. But at the same time, we also understand that English is, um, and well, in, in, in Africa, it will be English, French, and Arabic, the, uh, uh, the language of research. 
Yeah. Yeah, of course. But it's very good to hear, and as, as you also mentioned before, that it's very open to, to other languages and that you will actually also publish in, in uh, other languages other than the, the dominant uh, ones that, uh, yeah, as you rightly say, are difficult to, to avoid. Um, I have another question. It's a bit more on the, on the technical side, on the platform side, uh, which is, uh, does uh, adopting the platform, when we talk about adopting the platform, mean using the uh, UC UCT service or using the UCT products, including the software and the customizations? Um, so currently, the, the platform is on UCT server. That is the case. Um, and uh, the Continental platform does have the two products only, Open Journal Systems and Open Monograph Press. Um, and, you know, it's aligned to, uh, to the principles, you know, open source is aligned to, um, you know, to, to ensure uh, social justice is um, uh, taken place and um, yeah so so it's adopting the platform currently does mean um, the the software that we have yes um, but we're hoping that um, through the capacity building and the yeah the number of uh, publications that can come from each institution um, you, you know the infrastructure won't won't be uh, impeding this is also to say that Tom, in terms of customization, we kept the customization to an absolute minimum. And I think this was more in terms of upgrades. And this came from um, colleagues uh, from, from WACRIN and from PKP that if you want a, a successful upgrade, keep customization to a minimum. And I think that principle we try to pull through uh, to ensure that um, those that are participating, that if there is some change, that there is the, the level of disruption is kept to an absolute minimum. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, I see we have a, a few minutes left. So I'll just um, try to uh, squeeze in one more question from the from the uh, attendees, which is um, uh, also looking ahead a bit. So if the, or when the number of platform members, so uh, higher education institutions in Africa grows, uh, which governance, uh, governing structure are you thinking of? I, I think um, if, if it gains the traction that we anticipate that it will gain, um, we talked about the possibility of it residing with the Association uh, of African University, that being the governance structure, but at the same time, they should have representation from um, the three networks, which is WACREN, ASREN, and Ubuntu Alliance, and they may have representation, uh, there is LibCensus um, as, as, as an entity that looks after um, uh, uh, basically open access and, and input from librarians and researchers. So for me, that would be a kind of governance structure um, managed by um, uh, the AAU with support from the uh, three large network alliance, alliances and uh, support from the librarians and researchers. So it, it would move to the this this neutral uh, environment that you talked about before, and, and a broader group actually as well who can provide um, the input and be represented in the structure. Yes. Um, Maybe to, to 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 add around uh, the tenant model and each institution being responsible for their own scholarship. Um, you know, so so it's that's one of the reasons why I think the continental platform can be a success on the continent. Um, institutions wouldn't want um, a scholarship that that would be deemed inferior or would uh, see that, that institution in a in a negative light. So more than anything, higher education institutions would want to uh, 
push the, the, the research component through their, uh, through their scholarship and publish uh, what then showcases their, their strengths, uh, their, you know, their, their strengths in the, in the particular research uh, areas. And I think that would um, strengthen the, the platform even more where because there are these infrastructure components that is all in place, institutions now need to take ownership and own uh, the scholarship that comes from the institution by showcasing it um, through the continental platform. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I think that's a very, a very good addition. And uh, also the, the ownership part, and that has not been uh, too easy um, to, to really own the, the, own the, the scholarship um, and also the, the platforms on, on which it is then presented. Um, looking at the time, I think that, um, yeah, we have to kind of uh, wrap up. So I would like to uh, thank both of you, Reggie and Jill, very much for your time and for sharing more about the platform here today. It has been really uh, interesting for me to, to learn a bit more about the platform. And um, I, I think it, well, um, you kind of presented it a bit spontaneously, Reggie, that it went from this idea just put in practice and that now... I'm coming with questions to you about a vision, but uh, I think it is a, a good idea, and um, that it's it's um, that it's it seems it's it's taking off and working for a good reason. So I just wanted to uh, yeah to say thank you very much for your time and best of luck in the the coming years with the platform. Um, and I see a lot of people from the chat are also uh, thanking you for this great contribution. And and, and I also need to thank you, Tom. Agatha and Lucy for the opportunity for us to share. Thank you very much for that. Thank you so much. If I just can add one thing, uh, when this new book comes out in April, please give us some give us some note in advance because then we can also promote it on 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 our Twitter account, so that more people yeah. will have access to it. Great. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Thank you very much then. And uh, Agatha, will you close the this this yes, I will. session, this room? I, I will. I will. Okay. Thank you again. Bye bye. Thanks all for joining. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thanks for the opportunity.